Hello and welcome to today's video. Today I'll be diving into the hexagonal architecture, also known as onion architecture or ports and adapters. In this video, I'll cover the following topics. Explanation of hexagonal architecture, setting up a project following this architecture in Spring Boot and Java, creating tests to ensure adherence to hexagonal principles. The hexagonal architecture aims to establish a structure where the business or domain code remains independent and separate from technical implementation details such as frameworks and databases. The name hexagonal stems from a common visualization of application components resembling a hexagonal cell. At the core of the hexagon lies the domain core, housing the domain model and business logic implementation. It is written in plain old Java and should not rely on any dependencies to frameworks like Spring, Hibernate or Fane. However, modern applications require access to databases and the ability to expose endpoints. This is where the adapter layer comes into play. It contains all the technical details such as REST controllers, JPR repositories or REST clients. Adapters are often categorized into driving adapters, those that invoke the business logic like REST controllers, and driven adapters, those utilized by the business logic, such as database repositories. You might wonder if this architecture is simply a layered architecture, but here's the twist. The core and adapters only communicate via ports with each other. Ports are interfaces located in the core, making them framework agnostic. Both the adapters and services implement different ports, resulting in setups like the following. For example, we have a class called Task Service Impl that implements the port interface Task Service. The adapter class Task Controller depends on the interface and remains oblivious of the underlying implementation. On the flip side, we have an adapter class called Task Database Repo, which implements the Task Repo interface. The task service impl class depends on the port interface and also remains unaware of the underlying implementation. This principle is known as the dependency inversion principle. In a hexagonal architecture, this means that all adapters are dependent on the core, but the core has no external dependencies. The advantage is that you can replace adapter implementation details without altering the business logic, facilitating easier upgrades to new framework versions and enabling the writing of tests focused solely on the business logic, without concerning oneself with the technical details. In theory, each adapter and core could be its own module, but for simplicity in this video, we'll consolidate everything into one module and separate the core and adapters via packages. Let's get started. The first step is to set up our Spring Boot project. For this simple example, we need PostgreSQL, Spring Data JPA, Spring Web and Lombok as dependencies. You will find a link to the project's GitHub repository in the description. Now that our project is ready, let's create the base package structure, core and adapter. The core package includes three sub-packages, model for the domain model, service for the business logic and port for the ports. Goal is to implement the class diagram I've shown you before. So let's start the implementation by creating a record named task, which consists of an ID and name. Next, let's create the port interface task service and add a method to create tasks. To complete the course backbone, we must create the task service impl class that implements our interface. Now we want this service to persist tasks. For that, we'll need a JPA entity called task entity. Let's create it in a sub-package called persistence within the adapter package. To store our entity, we need a repository class which will name task database repo. That will implement our newly created port interface task repo. Finally, to actually store our entities into the database, we'll need a Spring JPA repository called task JPA repo. To make the JPA repo available to our adapter, let's add the component annotation to our database repo and inject the JPA repository via the constructor. An adapter acts as an intermediary between the framework and the core. That's why our adapter class task database repo maps our core model to a JPA entity, saves the entity to the database and returns a new task copy. Now our task service impl 
can use the repository. Since it must not depend on the actual implementation, we'll add a field of type task repo to be solely dependent on the port and use it to store the task. To have a REST endpoint that will use our service implementation, let's create a task controller and a task DTO class within a newly created adapter subpackage called controller. Our DTO uses framework specific annotations for JSON serialization and deserialization. The controller, again an adapter, exposes a post endpoint. Its main responsibility is to map its DTOs to the course model and use this object to call the service. However, we encounter an error that no bean of type task service is found. Normally, we would just add the service annotation to our service implementation. But remember, the core must be agnostic of any framework, so we can't use this annotation. Instead, we can create the package called Bootstrap, where we can create the class called Core Configuration and instantiate an instance of task service impl using the add bean annotation. Its dependency, the task repo, can be injected via Spring and used in the constructor. The bootstrap package is also the appropriate place to add any other configuration, like a custom JSON object mapper. Now the error in the controller is resolved and we have successfully set up a simple hexagonal architecture. Before we start setting up tests to check if our code sticks to a hexagonal architecture, I'd like to ask you to hit the like button and subscribe to my channel if you find this content helpful. I really value your thoughts, so please leave any comments, good or bad, below. To make sure a project is on the right track with our architecture, we can use ArcUnit. This is a tool that looks at your code and checks if it meets the rules you set. First, we need to add ArcUnit to our project by updating our pom.xml file. Then create the test class named ArcUnitTest. We mark this with the analyze classes annotation to tell it which part of our project to look into. Then we define some constants that represent our package structure. For the ArcUnitTest, we create the rule using a class called ArcRule. ArcUnit already knows about hexagonal architecture, which it calls onion architecture. We use this by using a method called architectures.onanarchitecture. This lets us tell it where to find our core model, our core services, and our configuration setup. We also tell it where our adapters are, one configuration for persistence and one for controllers. Next, we annotate our arc rule with arc test and run our architecture test. Turns out, I put the controller package in the wrong place. By moving it into the adapter package, our test now passes. This means if we ever mess up our architecture rules, our project won't build. So far, we followed hexagonal architecture by the book. But personally, I'm not a fan of manually instantiating each core service. This architecture originates from a time when XML was used to create spring beans. Nowadays, we like to keep things simple with annotations and let spring handle the setup. As a workaround, you can create a custom annotation in the core package and tell Spring Boot to create beans for classes with this annotation. Also, I don't like the service impl naming convention. I think it's a bit clumsy and I'd like to avoid it. That's why I don't stick to the rule of making service classes implement the port and let the adapters that use the services call them directly. While this approach deviates from the dependency inversion principle, it maintains the rule that the core must not rely on any adapter implementation. Theoretically, the core could still function as its own module, which is crucial for me. I appreciate that the core concentrates on the domain without concerning itself with technical specifics, fostering cleaner, more maintainable and testable code. Do you agree? Or do you believe it's better to follow the guidelines to the letter? Share your thoughts in the comments. Thanks for watching this video. See you next time.